anyone kind of guess? It has to go along with something that Christ came. Okay, Mark. Do you know? I came, and it's and I was kind of thinking about all of the impressive sayings that Christ was saying when. And um, the one that I felt was very, very appropriate, even though it didn't fit to a T of the I came, it is the I am the light of the world. Because really, when we start thinking about Christmas, isn't the whole thing, the whole, if you look around, everything around us is Christmas. So you start wondering, what is up with Christmas? What made it so important? And I think it all comes down to that one verse. It says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And I think we can all agree when we look at society, when we look at even the secular world, this is a great time of year, isn't it? We start asking everybody, well, I'm talking to ask parents, what's your favorite time of the year? It's Christmas. You ask kids, it's Christmas. There's something very, very special about the Christmas time of the year. And, you know, I'll be the first one to say that I love it when they bring back the peppermint mocha uh, Starbucks drink, you know, because I don't have to pay my extra $75, uh, my 75 cents for the extra pumps of peppermint. Um, if you walk into my house almost any time during December, you'll see my wife put on Mariah Carey Christmas, and she's rocking out to Christmas tunes, and there's special tunes that they are only allowed during that time of the year. Um, right now, Christmas number one is behind us, and we're all looking forward to Christmas number two, because that's when we get to break our fast and start eating meat. Um, and that's all great. But I don't think that's just what it's about. You know, I think there's so much more to that. But I also have to confess that this year seems a little different. And when I mean different, I'm not talking about different in a good way. I feel as the years pass by, we start realizing that this world that we live in keeps getting a little bit darker and darker and darker. You know, and when I look back over the last 12 months that even we've just been living here, I feel that there's a lot of darkness going on. A lot of funny stuff has been happening this year. You know, we have the Supreme Court decision that we're all trying to keep away from our kids, you know, and something that if we would if we would have talked about this 10, 15, 20 years ago, we never in a million years would have thought it would have happened. Um, you know, we, we start looking at all of the flooding that happens on the East Coast on a yearly basis, and you start thinking that, you know what, this can't be normal. You know, if this isn't a beginning of end time prophecies, I don't know what is. You know, when we even start thinking about all of the shootings, and, you know, we've been having shootings for years now, but the shooting that happened this year, really close to home you know, affect even our own church, we start thinking that, you know what? There's no sense of security in this world. There's no sense of security. And I just feel that it's, it's really, really dark. And it comes at times like this when I sit there and I reflect and I start saying, why God? You know, what's going on here? Where's your sovereignty? You know, I start coming to the realization that it's true, that it's that we live in a fallen world. And there's nothing that we can do to change that. The world is fallen. And where is God all of this? Where is the light at the end of the tunnel? And when I started thinking about this idea of light in a dark world, I started thinking of the book of Malachi. Now, can somebody tell me where the book of Malachi is in the Bible? Old Testament. Where in the Old Testament? Very, very end. It is the last book of the Old Testament. Okay? And there's something about that, that book that kind of stood out to me, and I kind of parallel it to the time that we're living in right now. And that book was a very, very dark book. And it was written in a very, very dark time in the nation of Israel. And the entire reason that the prophet Malachi wrote the book to this nation was the fact that he was reminding them, you know, that they were being very, very wicked. It's a whole book where he's basically just convicting everybody in the church. The whole nation of Israel was being convicted because they were basically living very, very far from the word of God. And like everybody was wicked. The people were wicked. And he talks about, you know, the nation that's turned his back on God in chapter two, verse eight. You know, he's addressing the people of the church, the people of Israel. And he says, will a man rob God yet you have robbed me? You imagine God is talking to, to his nation, the nation he has set apart from the very beginning, the ones that he's put his arms around and protected them and brought to them to, to where they are now. And he's telling them that you've robbed me. How do you rob God? You know, and then wrap your mind around that. Loving God. How does everyone, how's, how does anyone have the audacity 
to rob God and to think that they're going to get away with it. You know, and then I started thinking about it, and I say, you know, that's that's powerful when you read the way that he's he's you know convicting these people, you know, and he's and he's judging these people for you have robbed me. And I started to think, and I said, you know what? I wonder if there are aspects of our life that God can look to His church and say. I wonder if He can look at us and He can basically tell us, you know what? You're stealing from me as well. You know, I wonder if He can look at us and tell us, you know what? You guys are stealing praise from me. You know, are there areas of our life where God is pouring out blessings, where God's hands are sovereign, and then we don't acknowledge that and we don't offer Him praise for that? You know, are there areas of our life where we're stealing thanks from Him? Where he gives us things, he answers prayers. And so so many times we get caught up in what we get that we forget to turn around and say thank you. I know we all see it in our kids. We might have all seen it just a couple days ago where they are so wrapped up. You know, they are so happy with the presence that they receive that they forgot the giver of the presence. You know, I wonder if God's looking at us and says, you know what? You guys steal time from me. You guys steal time. I give you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that's time is one of those one of those things that every single one of us has the same amount of. It's a level playing field. And I wonder if God will look at us and say, you know what? You're not giving me time that's due to me. And I wonder if he'll look at some of us and say that you guys are stealing money from me. I wonder if we at times can be robbing him from his time. And that one is blatant. You know, because I wonder how many of us are faithful. In giving God what's his. When it comes to our times, when it comes to our money, when it comes to our resources, do we live our life like it's all ours? Or do we give him the portion that's 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 his? And one of the things that we be crystal clear of, God has the deepest pockets. God will never come to you and say, Hey, lend me a dollar. He doesn't need it. God's pockets are deeper than we can ever even fathom. But when I talk about tithes, I'm saying that we are the ones that are we are the ones that are losing. We're the ones that are missing out because God's going to do what God wants to do. But we are the ones that miss the blessing of the tithe and to see that how he works in that and the discipline he teaches us and the blessings that he provides in that. And it's the only part, you know, it's the only challenge in the Bible that he gives us. That when we tithe, he'll open up the, the windows of heaven and pour out blessings. And I wonder, is it our lack of faith sometimes that makes it hard for us to write the check because we don't have faith that he's going to bless the rest? So we had the nation, we had the people, the people were wicked. You know, so God's telling the people that you guys are wicked. But, you know, the next thing takes a whole other level because it says even the priests were wicked. The priests, can you imagine? The priest in chapter 1, verse 6, it says, To you priests who despise my name, you offer defiled food on my altar, you offer the blind as a sacrifice, you offer the lame as the sick, is that not evil? And I'm telling you this because I want you to get an idea of the nation at this time. What they were dealing with, you know. And the problem is, is you, you go through this whole book of Malachi, and it was a dark time, and it seems that there's absolutely no repentance. There's no repentance seen in the book. You know, God goes on, and he encourages his faithful few, because there's always a faithful few. God will never be without his faithful few, and he encourages them. But the rest of the people are completely arrogant. And they think that they don't need God. They think that their ways are better than God. They think we can throw God some crumbs and he'll be satisfied with that. We'll just appease him. You know. So it was a very arrogant time. And I look at the world that we live in right now, and I think that we would all agree, if we look around, we live in an arrogant time. The majority of, of the world around us, all of us secular society, you know, none of them believe that they need God. And they think that they all have it figured out. You know, everyone sees their opinion as better than everyone else's, and everyone thinks that they know better than God. And the arrogance is, is shown in, in chapter 3, verse 14. It says, it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance? It's so sad to, to think that that's what was going on in the world at the time. Now, have I convinced you guys that during the book of Malachi, it was a dark time? That the nation was wicked? that the leaders were like wicked, that there was like nothing but wickedness at the time. Now, here's the doozy. You have 400 years from the time of Malachi to the time of Matthew, which is the first book in the New Testament. How do you think those 400 years went? I think as dark as it was in Malachi, it only got worse. 
400 years of worse is the way that I look at it. And I think they got darker and darker and darker than ever. Because when the scene picks up in the book of Matthew, what are we left with? We're left with the current state of the church. The current state of the nation of Israel at that time. And who were the religious leaders? Levites and Pharisees? The scribe? You know, so you look at it, you say, this is, that was the nation of Israel at that time. Those were the leaders. Those were the leaders. And I believe that they were not even ready for what they were going to walk into. You know, because in John 1, 5, it says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the light that shines in the darkness. We all need a light that shines in the darkness. Because 2,000 years ago, God's, heart, God's followers' hearts were hard. They turned away from the truth and they were doing whatever that they wanted to do, whatever that they saw was right. And I like the way that it's put in the Old Testament in Judges 17.6. And I think this is really, really relevant. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. We start thinking about the way society is going on around us. We have no king. We have no king. We have no, we have no truth. And now what we start seeing is everyone just doing what's right in their own eyes. Because when you have no king, guess who leads? You know, I was talking to a friend of mine, and we were just talking about you know, just random stuff. And then he made a valid point. He was talking about all of these attacks on leadership. If you look at everywhere worldwide, you know, the attack is not on you know, people. The attack is on leadership. You know, if you look at the Middle East, you know, the Middle East, what was all of the shifting around that was happening? It was all in the leadership, wasn't it? You know, if you look at homes, you know, people will say that these kids are attacked more and more than – you know, these kids are suffering in ways and they're dealing with temptations that we didn't deal with growing up. And I said, you know what, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to say no. I think the attack is in the leadership of the house. I think that the men are being attacked. I think the marriages are being attacked. And Satan knows that if they can break a home, you know, those kids will be very vulnerable. You know, and it's the same thing that was promised. It says as you strike the shepherd, the flock will scatter. And I think that is exactly what we were seeing right now. Because when we attack leadership, when we take out leadership, Everyone rules over their own lives, and it's left with a lot of bad decisions. You know, it's amazing when we lose absolute truth in our life. You know, and I believe that this book, this book is a book full of statues. It's, it's like lanes painted on a road, basically saying that this is where you need to stay. Because if you cross over your lane, there's danger there. There's danger. You know, it's, it's kept, you know, to protect us from ourselves. From ourselves. In Psalm 19.7, it says, The testimony of the Lord is true, making wise the simple. What that means to me is that we need a leader. We need a leader in our lives. In our lives, we need something that we're going to set as this is absolute truth. This is what I am going to follow. You know, and in this book, we have a million case studies. We have a million situations. We see what happens when someone abandons the, God's plan and they decide to do it their way. You know, and I'll tell you that it's great that we have a million case studies in this book. I think there's a lot to learn from it, you know, and we've paid the price. You know, it, it, when I look to this book, I can tell you what happened to King David when he decided his way was better. I can tell you what happened to Samson when he thought his way was better. You know, I can tell you all of these Bible characters that when they deviated from God's plan, what happened to them and what the consequences of those decisions were. You know, I can tell you examples in my own life where I told God that, you know what, I think my way is better. I'm going to do it this way. And I can tell you what happened on the other side of that. You know, what that ended costing me in the long run. Every single time that I chose my plan over God's plan. But better yet, I'll be honest with you. I'll ask you guys. You guys know too. Aren't there circumstances in your lives, decisions that you made in your lives, that you felt that, you know what, my way's better? Every single one of us have. And then we quickly come and we realize that, you know what, God's way is always better. God's way is always better, and we always learn it the hard way. So I think a lot of the times when we start looking at our lives, when we start looking at the world around us, we might realize that, you know what, we might, we might not be too far off from where we were 2,000 years ago. Because even though Christ came and he bore the light, you know, the light that shines in the darkness, the light to convict every single one of us and to bring this light so that we may walk in light, I will tell you that I'm fairly confident when I say that every single one of us in this room we still have areas of darkness in our life. 
You know, there's still areas of our life where we decide that we're still going to live for ourselves. There still might be idols in our life where we decide that, you know what, I'm still going to worship this idol a little bit longer. You know, but I wonder if God is looking at our congregation right now. I'm wondering how he would address us. How, what he would tell us that we're robbing him of. I wonder, I feel like some of us, maybe there's gifts and talents that God's put in our life that we might even use, that we become very successful or very prosperous. But God's telling us that, you know what, that talent I put there, I put it there for my glory, for my use, for my kingdom. You know, I wonder what aspect it is in your life right now where you might be robbing God. And God's going to, and God's going to reveal it to you. And I believe that God is quick to reveal it to us when we lift our hearts and when we ask him. You know, it could be his service. It could be his glory. It could be his tithe. So right now, every single one of us, if we just shout out for prayer and say, you know what, God, if there's something in my life right now, if there's an area in my life of darkness that you want to address, I ask that you expose it for me. Because God wants to be light in your life. God doesn't want there to be any areas of darkness. He came to be the light. Christ hates darkness and it is his choice that he wants to eliminate. He wants to eliminate it because he's trying to be light in your life. And I'll tell you, it's not easy, though. One of the things, I love being a dad. Being one of my dad, I'll tell you, is probably like one of the top things on my list that I have going on in my life right now. You can tell because I have so many kids. Obviously, I signed up for it so many times. But um, there's one part of being a dad that's just very, very tough. And it's hard to admit this, but I will. And I do not like always having to be the brave one. Because when something happens at the Mishreki house, guess who has to deal with it? Me. And um, there's one circumstance that happened in particular, and I, I've used this illustration before. I don't know if I've used it here or not. But one of the weirdest things that being the dad has to do is that whenever anything goes wrong, I'm the guy they send in. Okay, So I remember there was one night in particular. It was a dark, rainy night, just you know everything that you can imagine. Probably about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, the alarm goes off in our house. Okay? But don't worry. We have Brinks, right? So the alarm goes off. I'm thinking, okay, great. You know, the phone rings. I answer the phone. It's Brinks. And, you know, they're like, hey, you know, what's going on? I said, I don't know. My wife and I were asleep. You know, the kids were asleep in their room. And the, the code on the system said this is the downstairs door. So um, they said, okay, Mr. Mishreki, what we need you to do is we need you to go downstairs and check it out. No. I wish it was. But... They're like, I need you to go downstairs to check it out. And at that point, I said, what am I paying you guys $35 a month for? I could have done that on my own, you know. But because I was the dad, I had, I took my flashlight, you know, and walked downstairs to figure out what was going on. And luckily, it was nothing. But, you know, there's something about walking into a dark area not knowing what you're going to find. And here's a thought for you. Christ came down from heaven, walking into a dark area, knowing exactly what he was going to find. He knew what he was going to find. He was coming into a very, very dark world. And what blows my mind even more than that, even though he knew what was waiting for him on the other side, he was excited to do it. You know, I can imagine Christ sitting at the right hand, you know, just waiting. You know, that 400 years since Malachi, there's been no prophets. You know, and he's just waiting and waiting. And then I can imagine the birth of St. Mary. And Christ is just like, all right, we're almost there. We're almost there. And as, as she grows year by year, getting antsy, you know, knowing that he's going to come down. And bear light. You know, God willingly entered into this dark world. He himself has the flashlight. He was the flashlight. You know, he knew that what he knew what he was going to expose. He knew the darkness that was at hand. He knew everything that was going to happen, and he knew that it wasn't going to be pretty. He knew how people would react. He knew how it would end. He knew that he would be hated, that he would be struck, that he would be spit on. That would end with him on a cross, saying, it is done. He knew that, and he was excited about it. He did it anyways. He did it anyways, but there's something about that just, like, that's great for him, but it's hard for us. You know, in our, in our house, we have French doors in our, uh, in, our, uh, in our bedroom. And I remember a couple years ago, I was cleaning, and I was cleaning, and I was doing all this stuff, and I had to pull back the curtain a little bit. And I pulled back the curtain, and right where the French door met, like, the house and, um, like, the baseboards and stuff, all that wood had turned brown. Okay? Kind of looked at it. I said, okay, that can't be good. Do you know what I did? I put the curtain back. 
me. That's what we would all do, wouldn't we? I just put the curtain back <laughs> because I just didn't want to see it anymore. Even though it was there, I didn't want to deal with it. I wanted to pretend it didn't exist. And because the reality of it is I knew that if I actually looked into that, if I actually saw what, what the actual problem was, that what I could actually find would be much, much worse. And I think that that's the way that we kind of approach life sometimes. We acknowledge there's a problem. We see there's a problem. We see the surface of the problem. But we say, you know what, we'll just leave it there for now. You know, I don't want to investigate what's really going on right there. And I think we all have discussions and issues that we avoid because we don't want to expose it to ourselves. Because we know on the other side of that, there could be struggle, be a difficult sin to overcome. You know, there could be a consequence if it's exposed. You know, it could result in pain, heartache. You know, and instead we just just we just decide let's not rock the boat, even if the boat has a hole in it. Let's just not rock the boat. But Christ never did that. Christ never did that. When Christ was there, He openly exposed evil and shined His light on it. Because when Jesus came, He came to bring the light. Think about the way that Christ performed his ministry when he was here. You know, he wasn't one to shy away from sensitive topics. You know, let me ask you, the nation of Israel at this time, they saw all the Pharisees, right? Like, do you think that they realized that they were corrupt? Probably. Like, you know, you read the stories, you say, you know, it's hard to, to imagine that. You know, they knew that they were hypocritical, but no one was bold enough to call them out until Christ showed up. Because Christ didn't shy away from anything. You know, 20, Matthew 23, 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Hypocrites. Because that's how Christ deals with things. But look at what else he did. And I think this is, this is beautiful. And I think that the, if there's one thing that I probably want you to kind of remember and take away from this, it's this point. You know, because this is a biblical truth that I think is easily, you know, applied to our life. That although he was quick to call them hypocrites, Although he was quick to judge them and to point out their flaws in front of every single person there, he never avoided the sick and the diseased. Never. Nor did he stay away from the tax collectors or the prostitutes. He, he went in with his light, but he went to, and he openly sought them out. Because when Christ comes, he brings his light. He always brings his light. We cannot come into the presence of Christ and not see his light but it's a light of love. It's a light of love. When we're open to his light, his light will fully embrace us with his love. It's a light of healing, a light of peace. And what Christ has done for us wouldn't be appreciated if it wasn't for darkness. You need the darkness to appreciate the light. It's our own brokenness and loneliness that makes me realize that we need him. It makes us realize that we need him. And Christ wants to give us all healing and completeness, but we have to expose the areas of our life that have darkness because he can't heal us if we're not willing to show it to him. If we're not willing to expose it to him. Because guys, that's what Christmas is all about. The world was dark. So dark. So dark it's not even documented. You take the darkness of Malachi and you add 400 years of darkness to it and everyone was lost. The priests, the people, everyone needed light and that's when it happened. Christmas. The light of the world came and it shone, it shined on everything. And I'll be the first one to, to confess that the areas of darkness in my life, I'm not happy with. And I wrestle with it. And I strive to get out of it. You know, and I believe that if there's areas of darkness in your life that you're not happy about it either. But sometimes we feel like we're in bondage to it. You know. And you might even admit that, you know what, Peter, I'm robbing God you know, in this aspect of my life. And at the same time, there's some of us that we might even feel that, you know what, God might be robbing me too. Because a lot of us have those periods of time in our life where we'll basically say, that, you know what, God, I'm, I'm really trying. I'm really trying. I am doing my best effort to step closer to you. But I don't see you stepping closer to me. And in James 4, 8, is one of the most beautiful verses, and I think that it is recited probably, it's got to be top 10. Where it's draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Have you all heard that verse? Okay, raise your hand if you've heard the verse. Draw near to God and he'll, okay, we have six people who've heard the verse. Great. Um, and I think it's a beautiful verse. But I'm telling you, as a dad again, I'll be honest, I don't care what my kids ever tell me. 
and they're young and they're ignorant. So a lot of the times right now, they'll tell me, no, dad, I love you more. And I said, buddy, it's impossible. It's impossible. Your little heart does not have the capacity to love me more than I love you. And they'll argue with me. But I'm telling you, as a dad, there's no way that we could be putting more effort into this than God. Because God loves you so much more than you can ever even attempt to love him. See, because like we said, we've all heard James 4.8. But really it's 4.8a. But nobody knows 4.8b. Okay? Because I'm going to read the, ver the verse in its entirety now. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So the translation to that is, look, the way that we draw near to God is by offering absolute repentance. By getting rid of the junk in our life that's separating us from him. That's the only way that he can draw near to us. Is the fact that there might be sin in our life right now that we hold dear. That we basically say that, you know what, God, I want both. You know, I want to have a good relationship with you, but I also want to keep the sin in my life. And God is basically telling you, it will never happen. It will never happen. So... What, what Christ is basically saying is, you know, I need you to get out of the darkness. Those aspects of your life right now that are dark, I need you to get out of the darkness. I need you to walk in my light. The reason you don't see me right now is because you're choosing darkness. And darkness and light cannot be in the same, in the same area. Isaiah 59.2, it says, Your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. That's, that's crystal clear. It's the fact that there's a lot of times in our lives, and I can look back to it in times of my life, where I'll basically look up to God and I'll say, where are you? And it might as well be clear as day, because I can almost hear it now, where God was saying back to me at those points in my life, it says, your iniquities have separated you from me. We cannot serve two gods. We cannot have two masters. So we need to decide. Because our God is always faithful. He's always faithful. When we are faithless, he is still faithful. But if we continue to choose to have darkness in our life, Christ can't show up. He is light, and he cannot be in the place of darkness because he will eliminate the darkness. That's the only way it will ever work because an entire room of darkness cannot overcome a single candle. An entire room of darkness cannot overcome one single candle. So the question is, is let's say, okay, great, Pete, I got you. You know, we're going we're gonna to walk in light. We need to walk in light. What happens after we start walking in light? In 2 Corinthians 4, 6, and this is one of those verses that sounds like it's kind of like a super run-on sentence, so just bear with me. It says, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge and the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So what that actually is kind of is it says, okay, great, you have light now. Christ shone his light on you. You know, it's shown in our hearts. And now we're, what are we to do? It's to give the light of the knowledge of God to other people. To other people. So now we are Christians and we all need to give light. Our personal mission statement. Our personal mission statement is that we should walk around everywhere giving light to people. And darkness is in an ironic way the best place to give light. Because what happens, if, have you ever turned a, a flashlight on in a room where there's already light? What happens? Nothing. So if our job is to give off light, I'm going to ask you, are there areas where you could be shining in your life right now? Are there areas where your light can take away darkness that's around you? You know, And I love this because when, when the wise men went to Bethlehem, they followed the star, right? What was the star? It was light. So you had this light that basically guided these people until they found Christ. He had the light, the star, that guided the people until they, find Christ, until they found Christ. It, it led them straight there. So what's our star in our life? The first thing, the star in our lives is our church. Isn't this where we come to find light? It should be. Every Sunday you should be thinking, I'm going to go find light. And that's where I'm going to find Christ. It's going to take me to Christ. Our Bibles, our fathers of confession, all of these things, all these sources of light in our life should, be, should directly be taking us to Christ. And I'm going to challenge you guys too that you guys should be stars in other people's lives. You guys should be stars. If I was going to ask you, are you, if you looked at your entire network of people, everybody that you know, 
Are you a star to anybody? We need to be. As Christians, we need to be. If we found the light, then we need to give that light to others. And I don't know where you are. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what aspects of, of your life Christ might be poking at right now. But Christ came to eliminate darkness. And that's what the season is all about. We're at the very tail end of the fast now. We have a very short period left. Are you preparing yourself for the light of the world that's coming? Are you preparing yourself? Are you ready to receive that light? Are you ready to stop being scared in the dark? You know, there's one thing that it literally happens every single day and it keeps it close to my heart. It's that my four-year-old Josiah, Every night when we do our bedtime routine, and I tuck him into bed, and, um, and I'm leaving, every single night he tells me, Papa, I'm scared, because the lights are really low. He always says, Papa, I'm scared. It's dark. And it kind of breaks my heart as his dad, because I never want him to be scared. And I want him to know that everything's going to be okay. But do you know what I do? Well, that room's on dimmers. So when I'm walking out of the room, I just turn up the light on him. And it gives him comfort and he goes to sleep. So that's why I want to urge all of you guys today that there might be aspects of darkness in our life right now. And those aspects of darkness might really be scary to us. But I challenge every single one of you guys to turn up the light. Turn up the light. Just expose, expose those areas of darkness to the light. And you'll see that Christ is faithful. And you won't be scared. And glory be to God for you.